Okay, in this part two video, we're going to look at building a universal controller for industrial electronic control. Now, I've built this controller in a plastic enclosure, and it's smoked plastic, so you can actually see through it, which is handy. You can see all the LEDs on the board, even when the cover is on. So inside my enclosure, I got my circuit, and I built my circuit on a Vero board. So I get a strip of Vero board, uh, that's just cut it to fit, and then mount all my components on the Vero board, and then slide it into the enclosure. If you look around the edge of the enclosure, you can see little slots where the proto boards can fit. Now on top, I have a terminal strip where, my, where I can connect my power and all my, uh, all my IOs, my control IO. And it's a chassis through hole type terminal strip like this, and you just bolt it to the top, and then you got your connections on the bottom. It goes through the chassis. Now the heart of the circuit is Arduino Nano. You can see here, that's my smarts. Then I have a voltage regulator, that's my power supply. Then I have a driver. It's a ULN2803. It's an 8-channel Darlington driver, which I could feed up to the, my terminal strip to drive my I.O. I also have a Bluetooth module, HC06 Bluetooth module. So I actually get into this box uh, with my smartphone uh, wirelessly. Now if you notice the driver chip, the 2803, instead of the driver chip I could have put in relays, or, or uh, triax or transistors. So this part here is, is customizable. You can put whatever you want in here. But I, I picked uh, the 2803 8-channel uh, driver. And you notice I got the chip in a socket so I could pull the chip out because there's another type of, of chip that I could put in here that's pin compatible. And instead of being a, a, a low side switch, it'll be a high side switch. So, and so, so instead of sinking current, I could source current just by changing the chip. Okay, here's the data sheet of my Darlington driver, my ULN2803. It's an 18-pin DIP chip, and there's eight drivers on board. And if you look at the schematic, you can see the Darlington configuration. It's open collector, so it could sync up to 500 milliamps at 50 volts. So it's a low side switcher. It also has freewheeling diodes built in, so you could drive inductive loads, like relay coils. Now, I also use these drivers as inputs from the outside world, so it could have an input from... 5 to 30 volts and then you just have to hook up the open collector of the Darlington to the GPIO of the Arduino Nano and you could use them as, as input drivers. Okay here's a data sheet for the UDN2982 source driver. So it comes in the 18 pin dip chip. There's eight drivers on board. And if you look at the schematic you can see the Darlington configuration with the open emitter. So this source driver can source 500 milliamps at 50 volts. So if you need to source current, you can use the 2982 chip. And if you need to sync current, you can use the 2803 chip. And both chips will fit in the same socket because they're pin compatible. Okay, I have my controller up and running a simple program. I'm just flashing two LEDs back and forth. Now those LEDs are being driven by my Darlington drivers. But instead of driving an LED, we could drive a relay, like this one here. Or we could drive a solid state relay. Like this one here, and it's opto isolated. Or we could use an AC solid state relay, like this one here, and it's also opto isolated, and we could run uh, heavy AC loads. Now, if you look on the board on my controller, you can see an LED that's on there. That's my power on LED, and that indicates I got 8 volts to my system. Now, if I power down the unit and power it back up, it automatically goes into its main program. That's my demo program, the, the lights flashing back and forth. So it's auto boot into the main program. But if you see, if you notice on the side of the box, there's a button. So if I power it down, then hold the button in, then power it up, it goes into a diagnostic mode. You notice that the main program isn't running, the LEDs aren't flashing. But you can see my HC06 Bluetooth module is flashing ready to be paired. So now I can get access to my controller through my smartphone and I can go into diagnostic mode. Okay, I powered up my controller in diagnostic mode and I've paired it to my smartphone. And I have an app running where I can control all the I.O. on my controller board through Bluetooth. So I can turn the LEDs on and off. I can toggle them. If I hold it, which will toggle automatically. I go to LED number two, on and off. Or toggle. We're all both on and off. 
and both toggle. So I have total control over my controller through my smartphone so I can do diagnostics. I also could get into the operating system, the fourth operating system that's on board. And I could change configurations. I could actually uh, do programming over the air. I could do custom, um, custom diagnostics. So it's very versatile when we have control through Bluetooth. Okay, I powered up my controller in diagnostic mode. And I'm running a serial terminal program on my smartphone called BlueTerm. And I paired to my HC06 on my controller. And I got into the fourth operating system that's running on board my controller. So you can see here, I'm running a little script. It says pin 2 high, question mark. So it's going to ask the state of uh, pin 2, which is connected to the push button. The push button on, on the side of the controller. Then it's going to print out the condition. And it's going to do a carriage return. And it's going to do that many times. So whatever is from the beginning of the line up to many will be repeated over and over again. So we can actually test the state of the switch. So if you hit enter, you can see it's indicating high. So if I press the button, and she goes low. So that's a little example of how we could actually run little scripts for diagnostics purposes if you want to troubleshoot the controller. Now when I go to mount my control box, I usually use a DIN rail. So if I mount this on a DIN rail, it's easy to snap off and I could bring it to my bench like you see here and I could actually power up the whole system through the USB port on Arduino Nano. I don't need my external power supply. So it just makes it more handy if you mount the box on a DIN rail and it's easy to, t to put on and off of the machine that, that it's, it's going into. So here's another box that has a DIN rail mount and there's our DIN rail. So basically it just snaps in like that. And you just mount that, these two slots. You can mount it anywhere you want, you can mount it down. And then take it off, just release it from the DIN rail. And you can take it off, put it on your bench, and then you can work on it. Now if you need to monitor an input voltage, so a voltage that's coming into the, into the control box through the terminal strip, it could be high voltage, it could be low voltage, it could be AC, it could be DC. You should also use an opto-isolator for monitoring input voltages for safety reasons. So you might not be sure what kind of opto-isolator to use for all the different voltages and all these different scenarios, but I have a circuit that will work on all scenarios. If you are having trouble interfacing a device to your microcontroller, this will be the solution. Now, this opto-isolator has an input voltage range of 5 volts to 240 volts, AC or DC. Now inside this opto-isolator is a bridge rectifier for the AC input and a constant current source that drives the LED which will saturate the output transistor and switch 5 volts to your microcontroller. Now all you have to do is calculate Rx, that's, your, that's the input resistor, for your threshold input voltage. Now if you look at the data sheet and you look at the external threshold characteristics chart, it will tell you how to calculate Rx for your input threshold. So this is the HCPL3700. It's a little bit pricey, but it might be worth it. Okay, I'm going to go through a scenario that happens quite often. And I'm going to pick a piece of equipment from the food industry. Now this machine here is a meat processor. It's actually a meat grinder. And new, they're about $20,000 US. So this will be used in a meat processing plant. There will be a few of these in the plant. So one day the plant decides to shut down. And they send all their, their machines uh, to the auction for liquidation. And potential buyers come. And they check out the, the machines. And they're usually labeled as is, pulled out of uh, service as working, but they're as is. So somebody buys a machine and he takes it home and he, he gets his uh, electrician to wire it up and it doesn't work. So the electrician gets a schematic and starts troubleshooting. Now inside the machine there's a lot of contactors and relays which are easy to get. They're off the shelf parts. And you can see there's a ladder logic a schematic and there's a lot of motor start circuits and they check it okay. Then it comes down to the brake module, which you see on the schematic. It's just a rectangle labeled brake module. And the electricians found out that one of the contacts is not coming on in the brake module. And that's the problem. So there's no schematic. There's no information on the brake module. It's just a part number. So they inquire about the brake module, and it's not available. So this is where you come in. You could get the brake module and troubleshoot it, get it up and, uh, up and running, and install it back into the machine. 
Now, once you do this a few times, word will get out that there's somebody working on these these boards because everybody thinks these boards are black magic, and you'll get more job opportunities. Okay, if you're still watching this video, maybe you realize that this is something that you could do. Now, this is not for everybody. You have to like doing this kind of work. You got to talk to people, be a little bit outgoing, uh, be willing to work, be willing to learn. Go to equipment auctions and talk to potential buyers of these machines, get well known, get a reputation. Now, you, now when you build these boards, you don't have to go with this complex like, like I've shown here. It could, sometimes it could be something very simple to get somebody up and running. Now I've done a lot of this. This is what put me through university. So I just wanted to pass this on to maybe help somebody out there.